To understand why a bizarre device like this one here exists, we need to travel back to the time of its release. The year was 2006. High performance consumer SSDs were still two years away, an eternity in computer hardware terms, and even the fastest consumer hard drive on the market, the Western Digital Raptor X barely stood out from the pack. So there was a very real appetite for faster boot devices. Meanwhile, Intel's Core 2 Duo Conroe platform was one of the most compelling upgrades for gamers in years, but it required an upgrade to shiny new DDR2 memory, resulting in an abundance of castaway DDR1 memory sticks. So there to capitalize on these two conditions was Gigabyte. The idea here was really simple. Ah, here we go. Take some of the leftover DDR1 memory that you already have lying around, and instead of spending thousands of dollars on an SSD, take it, chuck it on this thing, and use that as your system boot drive. I never had one of these when they were new. Back then I was busy spending all my money on textbooks I'd never read for a degree that I'd never finish. That worked out great. So when I saw this on eBay for like 30 bucks, I figured, what the hey, let's take a look at it. Let's start with the PCI connector. Now on the surface, you might think that this looks very similar to a modern PCI Express SSD, but you'd be wrong for a number of reasons, starting with the connector at the bottom. This is a PCI connector, and this interface capped out at just 133 megabytes per second. That is even less than SATA 1 at 150 megabytes a second. But that wasn't even its main problem. PCI is what's called a shared bus, which means that every device on it has to fight over that 133 megabytes a second. And thing is, many older motherboard designs not only had their PCI slots hooked up to it, they even had onboard devices, like their built-in sound card and network interface, running off of it already. So this slot was only suitable to use for power. It's also got a SATA port, so that's how it actually communicates with the rest of your system. Unlike PCI, SATA ports are not forced to share the same bus, so that means full performance to this port all the time. Well, at least as long as you don't run into a bottleneck elsewhere in your system, like on the link between the South Bridge and the North Bridge. I remember people used to hit those all the time when they were running multiple drives in RAID 0. Now, let's talk about this chip right here. This Xilinx FPGA probably represents a big chunk of the cost of the iRAM. FPGAs offer incredible flexibility, allowing one to basically manufacture a processor in software, then program that processor into a blank one. Now the cost is that you lose some efficiency and your per unit costs go way up. If this was a high volume product, they'd create custom silicon for it. But Gigabyte, even at the time, admitted that their first production run was a measly 1,000 units for the entire world. So clearly custom silicon wasn't gonna be a problem. Let's talk about why they needed this processor though. Fundamentally, the principle of storing data is the same between RAM and hard drives. You got your ones and you got your zeros. But the way the binary data is organized on the device is completely different. A hard drive uses a physical spinning platter covered in circular tracks that are divided up into sectors. So when your operating system asks for a particular bit, it tells your hard drive where to move the read head to grab the information it needs as it goes whipping by at 7200 revs per minute. By contrast, RAM stores bits, so zeros and ones, in cells that are laid out in a giant grid and that can be instantly accessed as long as you know the intersecting row and column, which is known as an address. Well, that's exactly the performance advantage that we're after here, but it also means that you can't just treat this thing exactly the way that you would a hard drive. So our FPGA is programmed to act as a translation layer between our SATA interface here and the memory controller that's built into it. Now let's look at the memory slots. 
These are operating at DDR1 200 MHz. And while modern memory modules and their controllers would operate at much higher frequencies, even with the inefficiency of using SATA instead of NVMe like we would for any solid state drive today, that is a theoretical limit of 1.6 gigabytes per second between our FPGA and our RAM here. That's as fast as a decent modern SSD and way faster than a hard drive. Well, <laughs> SATA bottleneck notwithstanding. So let's get the rest of these RAM sticks on here. Let's fire this thing up. All right, so as you guys probably saw, I already had Windows fired up on this thing before we started. So, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead, put all my RAM back into place. Let's throw this on the one accessible PCI slot we have on this board and fire it up. Well, that's curious. It's empty, no bootable device. So our Gigabyte iRAM is showing up as our first boot device, but we fail to boot. My device that was full not half an hour ago is now empty. And therein lies the Achilles heel of the Gigabyte iRAM. DRAM is what's known as volatile memory. So each cell on a memory chip, by the way, if you like this shirt, lttstore.com, is made up of a transistor and a capacitor. The transistor acts as a switch, and the capacitor either gets filled up with electrons, that's a one, or emptied of electrons, that's a zero. The problem is that if left alone with no power, all of the cells gradually lose their charge and zero out. No data left means no Windows boot. So we should probably get Windows reinstalled. Gonna use my super definitely genuine Windows XP CD here. Actually, that's not probably anymore. I have checked this. It does in fact have Windows XP on it. Can fix that. All right, so here it is. Our whopping four gigabytes of unpartitioned space. Now, you might wonder, why are you using Windows XP, Linus? And the reason is that it's actually the most recent version of Windows that will run on a four gig drive. I think I should even have about a gig left over when we're done here. All right, so while that fires up, let's talk about what happened there. This was the first thing Brandon asked me about, this weird battery case looking thing over on the far right of the card. That is exactly what it is. And what it does is it takes the power that's being given to the card through the PCI slot and stores a little bit of it. So that in the event that I turn off my computer, my operating system doesn't immediately disappear and I need to completely reinstall it and all my boot drive applications all over again. Now it wasn't a perfect solution. And in fact, Gigabyte only rated it for, I think it was either 16 or 18 hours of power loss, but it did mean that in the event of an accidental power supply unplug or a short power outage, you weren't stuck starting fresh in Windows XP. You know, changing your, uh, I was always partial to the, the chess pieces picture, you know, and all that good stuff. So it's funny, I had actually intended to do some you know, comparative benchmark testing between our iRAM and this old hard drive here. But uh, what I realized is that once you've got the operating system installed on the iRAM, you've only got about I don't know, 800 megabytes of space left over. So it's, it's not really a whole lot to work with. Oh wow, and I just installed one game and it hit 365. Problem number two is even if we did wanna do game loading times, for example, there's no Windows XP driver for the Titan XP graphics card. I have to go get another graphics card. You know what? They benchmarked it to death back when it was released. It's a little bit faster in terms of real world performance and a lot faster in terms of synthetic performance, particularly when it comes to random reads and writes. So you can see here, we're at a right steady 125 or so megabytes per second. Unlike a hard drive, which would start at the outer edge of the platter, like physically, and then taper off in terms of performance as it makes its way to the data that's stored closer to the center. Not so here. 
And this is where things get really crazy. That access time, literally 0, 0.0 milliseconds. Hard drives would be all over the place in here. <sighs> now I'm just gonna go ahead and restart. Oh no, I turned it off! Actually, that's okay. Because as long as the power supply still has power, you can actually see there's an indicator LED here on the card. It's getting standby power off the slot and that's keeping the memory cells constantly refreshed so that they don't drain. But if I were to do this, it's gone. So cool things about the iRAM. Really, really fast. In spite of its interface bottleneck, especially compared to hardware that existed at the time. But its downfalls were of course the aforementioned interface bottleneck, the kludgy power loss resiliency, and the poor capacity. Because, you know, for sky's the limit at any cost enthusiasts, something like this honestly doesn't even seem that crazy. Except that it was rated for eight gigabytes of maximum capacity and practically speaking, there was actually no way to achieve that. Unbuffered DDR1 DIMMs only went up to one gig per stick. And while ECC server DDR1 memory modules were made in two gig capacities, this card has no support for ECC memory. And then the final nail in the coffin was of course that it was really expensive. If you had the memory lying around, and if you were way too lazy to just flip it on Craigslist, you could use that memory. But otherwise, at around $90 per stick at the time, you were looking at $500 to fully load this thing up. That is pretty steep for a five or at best 10 second boot time or game loading time advantage. So with the high cost and inconvenience as major factors, Gigabyte probably didn't make many more than the first thousand of these, but the iRAM was definitely a sign of the direction that computer storage was heading. In fact, Intel's Optane technology is a low latency, solid state storage tech that can now be found on memory modules, just like, you know, they look just like these ones, and used as a layer that goes in between conventional RAM and SSDs and servers, with the added bonus of Optane being non-volatile like an SSD. So if you guys liked this video, maybe check out our explainer on Optane at the link below. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss our upcoming video checking out some cool SSDs from Liquid. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed this look at a really fascinating piece of retro technology as much as I did. I will see you guys in the next video. Colton? Ah, 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 what, what the hell?